All right, hello everybody. This is Antonio Wolf, and I am here with the funky academic Irami Osei Frimpong. Would you go ahead and introduce yourself to the audience? Yeah, thank you for having me on. My name is Irami Osei Frimpong. I run a little uh, website called The Funky Academic, and I come out with a show on Thursdays on YouTube. So if you like what you hear, you know, you can go to YouTube and put in Funky Academic and take a look at the show. All right. So uh, for those of you who don't know Irony, uh, Irony is perhaps, in my opinion, one of the most important political thinkers around today. I mean, uh, as you know, my channel is mostly about philosophy, particularly Hegelian philosophy. And when it comes to what does it mean to use philosophy in our everyday lives, how important is it? Political philosophy, which uh, goes way farther than just politics is probably the most important and uh, upfront thing uh, on there. So I suppose we'll start this with, uh, how do you view uh, the role of philosophy uh, in people's everyday lives? You just, most people go about and say, oh, philosophy, what do I need that for? You know, uh, you have even leftists and Marxists like, oh, philosophy, we don't need that. We just need to organize the working class. And you know, these questions about philosophy, they don't matter. Right. The, how to create meaning out of life is not obvious and it's not immediately known. Um, we don't come out of the womb knowing how to turn the next, you know, 70, 80, hopefully 90 years of, it, of, your, of your life into something meaningful. And what would that even mean? And, and how to make sense of that task and that project. So a lot of people age without actually turning their life into meaning. And I think that's kind of a sad way to squander your life. Um, and so philosophy and other things, religion, they're, they're, and even traditions um, kind of help you, guide you through thinking through how to turn your living existence into something that's meaningful, how not to screw up your marriage, how not to screw up your kids, how not to screw up your contributions to civil society and your work, how not to screw up your contributions to your polity. All of these things can be screwed up. Just talk to someone who screwed up their kids. It's always sad to talk to, you know, baby boomers, people in their 60s who did everything right in their career and feel and in some ways would like to consider themselves a success or, you know, progressive or woke. But then they look at their kids and they're just sorely disappointed. Or they look at their marriage and like, well, you know, I kind of zigged when I should have zagged with respect to my marriage. Or someone, you know, screwed up their job either as a boss or as an employee when they didn't have to, but they wish they would have just had a little bit more wisdom with how to conduct themselves or someone who was on the wrong side of politics for half their life and then realized that they were fighting the wrong battle. So instead of having all of those regrets, we can kind of, kind of think through the issues before we fail the exam in order to learn the lesson. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, on that line, you know, in the U.S., uh, we're, we're the land of, uh, you know, where libertarianism was born, basically. Uh, we view the state generally as a populace as something that we have to bear with. You know, it's a, just a, a thing that's there that we think we kind of need it, but most of us, it seems that we have the suspicion that we really don't and we right. wish it wouldn't be there. Uh, what is the importance of the state in your view? Right. So in the U.S., where Libertarian was born, it's just, you know, the, the, um, the kind of worship of property rights, because those are the only rights we could think through at the time. And, you know, with Locke helping work through the Constitution of South Carolina, it's just not obvious to people that self-governance ma self matters, right? As long as we have a state that can secure our pre-political rights, including our, mostly our property rights, then the act of self-government seems to be a luxury good. Um, and that's why, you know, a lot of people don't mind authoritarian leadership as long as that authoritarian leadership would secure their property rights. They, they would cede government in a second to other people as long as it would cede their government, uh, their, their property rights. So we don't really have a sense of both community and a sense of purpose that extends past, like a, a national purpose that extends past what secures my pre-political 
Right, which is why nobody really cares that either the the political system is completely alienating. Like in theory, either one of us should be able to run for Congress, but you know we've been locked out for a variety of reasons. And you know neither party wants actual their candidates, especially their incumbent candidates, to debate um, because they don't really want the people to have uh, informed decisions. And the reason they don't want the people to have informed decisions and the reason the people don't really want informed decisions is because the people don't want to govern. They just want someone else to govern and secure their property rights. Um, and that's kind of an American ethic that, that hollows out a lot of our other problems. Like what happens when the family disappears? Like that, all right, so the idea that libertarianism works will work in a tradition and within a tradition and emerging from a tradition that already has a lot of other big questions answered in a satisfactory way, right? If we have marriage and family answered in a satisfactory way, if we have, um, you know, the role of employees and employers and production and the economy answered in a satisfactory way through tradition, if we have religion uh, like kind of met out through a satisfactory way through tradition, um, then it's not obvious that we need the government to do anything else other than secure property. The problem is if our traditional economy seems to not do what we want a tradition uh, an economy to do if it doesn't secure jobs for everyone if it doesn't you know secure the economic conditions for political freedom or like sense of dignity and well-being um then we need another actor an authoritative actor to actually fix <laughs> and adjust our economy because the traditional economy wasn't doing it Right. And so if we liberalize our economy, if for some reason we have open markets now overseas and it just becomes um, advantageous for the, the capitalist class who used to actually source and produce for, um, you know, uh, the nation with using work from the nation, if it becomes advantageous for them to source and produce for the nation from outside of the nation, there is nothing to protect the workers from the nation. Or if there's a technological innovation, for example, uh, jewels. I remember when jewels kind of ran through, I was working at the UGA, when jewels kind of ran through, uh, about, was that five years ago, five, six years ago? Because vaping, about 15 years ago, vaping was uncool when it first started, but then I think jewels made it cool. And then uh, the market's not gonna take, not gonna, gonna keep 14 year olds from, from uh, 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 taking in their mango flavored jewel. And so you had all of these kids getting addicted to tobacco and just a government that just secures property rights and doesn't do anything to, to manage the market isn't going to keep not only it's not just your kid from getting addicted to, to, to tobacco, but you don't want all of your friends, all your kids friends to be addicted to tobacco. Right. So right. you need the government to like protect us from the market, right? And then what happens when you liberalize the family? Like if marriages are held by some sort of traditional, uh, held together by some sort of traditional uh, religion or traditional conception of gender roles, what happens when you liberalize all that and you don't give um, any other content to what should a marriage be? Then there's no real difference between kind of being married and just kind of dating in a, in, a, in a world of no-fault divorce. So we need government to actually give an ideological content, if there is one, on why people should or should not actually get married. And if we think that there's a social benefit to marriage, we need government to like actually support people being married. Um, I think there's a peculiar kind of freedom. And, you know, there's the reasons I think this. And, this, yeah, and we do a lot of, both of us do a lot of work on Hegel. So I hope your viewers appreciate this argument that uh, marriage is a particular kind, allows for a particular kind of freedom. If it allows for a particular kind of unity, that's different from the unity that you get in civil society when you're just um, buying and exchanging goods. Or, and that's different than the unity you get as a nation. It's a, it's a kind of smaller unity of the family and it's immediate. There's no like person and there's no entity between you and your partner, which is one, why you need to pick partners very well because, you know, even if you sleep with a gun under your pillow, you guys share the same pillow. So <laughs> there's, a, there's no real quarter 
for the excesses of marrying a bad partner. And two, um, uh, you get to allows you to kind of have your family the way you and the other person immediately decide to have the family, which is a, a, a form of self-determination that's not available in civil society. Um, kind of an immediate self-determination. So marriage actually can be can be supported as an institution of freedom and it can be undermined by the market and the market's telling, um, you know, your spouse that if you wake up angry one day, just divorce. <laughs> the market's telling your spouse that um, the therapist you paid to tell your sp- to tell your problems to is telling you that, well, you just, if you're sad, just divorce. It won't affect the kids. Like there are all these market influences that you need protection from and cultural influences and special influences uh, um, was um, special special interests that you need protection from if you're going to determine the family the way you want it. So you need the government to step in and say, like, look, we need to support people having families the way they want to, as a you know, nuclear unit, want to organize their family and not be undermined by market um, influences and advertisements because they work. And so we need the state to protect all of our other freedoms that are not concerned with property. Um, and by the way, this is what I, I suspect this is what's, um, this is what is driving a lot of the current trans panic. Like the old trans panic was like, well, we're scared about sports. We're scared about trans men competing in sports and the um, transphobia. And we're scared about trans men like perving out in bathrooms, um, looking at girls in bathrooms. That's kind of de class A and gross trans panic. I suspect the new transphobia is going to be a form, and we're going to see it, and we've already started seeing it. I started seeing it this year. It's going to be a form of, look, liberals are so careless that they will screw up your ability to have grandkids because they're going to turn your son into uh, a biological grandkids because they're going to turn your son into uh, an infertile girl or they're going to turn your daughter into a boy. So liberals are so careless that they're going to screw up your family freedom. So you that's going to be the new transphobia against like it's going to be that it's not going to be it's not actually going to be targeted at the trans people themselves. It's going to be targeted at teachers and people who the conservatives can now um, promote as being so careless that they're going to market. They have an agenda to market this lifestyle to your child. And since children are malleable, they will abide by it. And now you're not going to get grandchildren and you're not going to be control of your family. So we need to uh, that's going to be the new transphobia. And that's going to be centered around family freedom because people should be able to kind of determine the shape of their family. And, um, and that's how the conservatives are going to talk about using the state to protect the family, right? Like, and again, all these things used to be, at least if you talk to the rulers and the people in power, they used to be sufficiently handled by tradition and convention, kind of thoughtlessly the way people live their lives. But now through technological intervention or, you know, even an internal critique about how the United States was never actually that good for workers and especially minority ones and and Mm -hmm. could have used improvements with respect to gender rights. Like the, the casual liberalization of all of these other forms of life that used to be handled by tradition are um, like insert all of these other instabilities that libertarian governance is kind of clueless to handle. Even me, I, you know, just yesterday, actually, this is the truth. No, two days ago, I, uh, I ordered a set of like Catholic, um, like, schooling materials to go through with my kids, like Catholic homeschooling materials. And not, and, and not just because, and, and it's not necessarily because I, I'm raising them Catholic, but I'm just realizing the spiritual vacuum that liberalism does when it like inserts itself in the church. And I need my kids to have more spiritual content. So I could, I could just like 
<laughs> sort of way going sending them to Catholic school. I could just like teach them Catholic culture. And then whether they become Catholic or not, it's irrelevant, but at least they'll have spiritual content to kind of work through because I think the spiritual content is important. And like, I, I, I don't think people underestimate what it means when you liberalize without replacing the content of like something like, you know, Christianity or the family or anything like that. So they'll learn about mortal sins and venal sins and they'll learn the litany of saints. And then at the end, they can kind of like either forget them or become Catholic. It's, you know, that's up to them, but they'll have content to work with. I mean, my kids know content about you know the pantheon of ancient greek people they should know the uh, content about the, the the pantheon of 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 catholic saints and just kind of like a rich way to talk about relationships and sins and even if even if it's even if it's ultimately something that they'll reject i want them to have that content because i've seen what happens when kids don't have that content well it ends in drugs like in a, <laughs> in, a, in, a in a non-obvious right, right. way but and i don't have the money for rehab so I feel like I, I should just make like cultural Catholics and then. <laughs> All right, right. So it actually makes a, a good uh, segue for. Uh, um, normally, people don't think about freedom as requiring anything more than just yourself. You know, in America, freedom is just arbitrary choice of, you know, just so long as someone else doesn't impose on me, uh, I am free. Uh, but in the far more advanced, and it's not just Hegel, you know, it comes from the line from Rousseau and all these other thinkers, uh, that freedom isn't just individual. Uh, institutions are really important. Can you uh, talk a bit about that? Yeah, institutions provide the content for your choice, right? So you can have, if I'm a vegetarian and I just walk into a restaurant and I have a choice between lamb, chicken, and beef, I can have all the choice I have. And like some people say, well, why are you whining? You have so many choices. But I have choices, but none of those choices actually realize who I am as a vegetarian. So I need more than choice. I need the person who's going to like the world to provide me with a choice worthy option so that I can realize who I am. Right. So this is why real freedom isn't just about choice among alienating options. It's about actually being able to negotiate the content of the options among which you choose. Right. And so a market freedom where you're completely alienated from uh, the goods that are produced, none of them reflect you, but yet you still have to realize yourself in choosing them. It's kind of like what a lot of us felt in 2016 when we had to choose between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. And, um, and you just either way, you feel bad at yourself. You had choice. And if you just think that... Um, Freedom is a matter of choice. You had choice, but none of those choices you thought, like, realized who you were. And especially if you think that the primary uh, of both parties were rigged, or at least the primary of the party that you went for was rigged, then you just completely, that, that choice is actually you actively alienating yourself from the realization of yourself. So you can't just be free in your head. You can't just be free in your mind. You need to realize that freedom like and in the world and you realize that freedom in the world through these institutions, um, through our institutional entanglements, through our families, through our participation in civil society, through our participation in politics, through our participation in religion and art, right? If you, you're not, re it's not real until you can do it and you can't do it until like you're accommodated in doing it, right? Um, you know, you can say like, well, you know, I'm a very famous playwright. I mean, I would be a very famous playwright if, um, you know, any of my plays were produced. Well, then you're not really a, a famous, you're not really, are you really even a playwright if none of your plays are produced? You, but producing is something you can't do by yourself. You need like permits and an audience and like an entire infrastructure of media and like a director and then like actors. And that means you need like an infrastructure for casting. So to do anything and be anything is kind of a plural endeavor in a way that we don't talk about as good liberals who think that we're self identified and self, um, self-realized, um, independent entities, anything that, anything that's meaningful, like is going to, anything that meaningfully is, is going to be through 
an interaction. For example, you're only listening to me because of Antonio, right? <laughs> like without Antonio's work, you don't hear anything that I'm saying, right? So you could say that, mm -hmm. you know, if, if something I'm saying is completely revolutionary and changes your life, well, that Iron Man guy really changed my life. But it wasn't really me. It was only me through interacting in my computer with a microphone I didn't make and Antonio emailing me setting this up and like him setting up the infrastructure to have this um, this uh, station that I get to realize myself in the world and you get to enjoy it. So what looks like a single conversation between my voice and you is actually once you kind of peel back the layers, the result of like all manners of labor and work and commitment. And that's why you get to hear me today. It comes through a microphone and all of this equipment that I neither designed nor built. And then the institutions of YouTube or the podcast you're listening on. And then Antonio having the gumption to reach out to me. Like all of this stuff goes into the interaction between me and you right now. And until we actually and if we want to promote interactions like these, we need to promote the quality of infrastructure that enables them. And we just aren't serious about talking about the quality of infrastructure that enables them because we think, well, if I had something to say, then somehow magically you would hear me. And like, no, that's just not how the realization of freedom and speech is like works. <laughs> like right, it took right. all of these other things and the support of all of these other things that the market may or may not provide in order to actually me f for you to hear what I'm saying right now. All right. So on that uh, topic, uh, we see that uh, from the liberals and even from, you know, the uh, socialists left, uh, we see people attacking traditional institutions like the family and religion. And, uh, it's pretty clear that a lot of these people have a personal uh, animosity towards this because they come from, failed forms of those institutions Very and they good. misunderstand that these institutions as such are completely bad uh, what do you say to somebody who uh what can you say about a uh, to what extent can you rely on institutions when uh, they are the ones that are responsible for your dependence on them uh, but they have failed but they have failed right just because like you have a bad mother doesn't mean motherhood is bad just because you have a bad family doesn't mean that families are bad just because your religion is like off that doesn't mean that spirituality is bad or not important and to throw and the absence of all of these like a lot of these are are kind of guardrails against the predations of the market right and so and the immediate satisfactions that market markets produce so what we have to do is actually work through and this is kind of a patient process if it's if it's done right work through what virtues these are institutional forms have like how is the family a realization of a particular kind of freedom that you can't get through market relations what is the difference between dating someone indefinitely and actually marrying them <laughs> like what is the difference between um like what's at stake when we just ditch spirituality and throw everything that matters into like sensory pleasures right so now if we don't have duty because of its of a, of, a, of a spiritual or rational awakening, but only because of its kind of how it makes us feel at the moment, what's at stake in that? Well, anyone who can manipulate our feelings and now can manipulate like <laughs> who we are, our being, right? Because there's no guardrails against that. So we need like, so there's a place for religion, but just because that we have a culture of abuse doesn't mean that its use is ridiculous right um, mm -hmm. we just have to work through rationally what kind of freedom does a more perfect form of these institutions mean just because some states are bad some states are authoritarian doesn't mean you get rid of states <laughs> right? it right. means like how do we work through and build in democratic institutions within states to have states that actually represent the people that they're supposed to serve and are actually realizations of the people that they're supposed to serve. All right. And if we can't throw all of our culture to the predations of the market, then we can't be surprised when 
the meaning that comes through these institutions and the stability that comes through institutions is like it's part of the collateral damage. And that's and that's why liberalism isn't really like a thoughtless liberalism isn't really appealing for anyone who has to actually carve meaning out of their life. And I think people start seeing this young, but def it definitely becomes clear or it should become clear when you have kids and you realize that like liberalism is not going to raise your kid to um, actually be worth a darn. Right? Like, right. Liberalism without any institutional respect for conventions isn't going to actually make someone who understands why they shouldn't do what they want when they want to because they want to. Right. At first, you see it when dating, when you try to date a liberal and you realize that there's flakes. <laughs> they, don't, they don't keep their own promises. But then it becomes real when you um, when you when you have kids who like who need to be taught that they should do things that they don't want to do. Why should I eat something that I don't want to eat? Um, and the liberal answer is that you shouldn't. <laughs> The more rational answer is you don't know why you shouldn't do this. So you have to um, obey me anyway. And while we talk about what health means and all of that stuff in ways that you still won't understand, but you still have to do it anyway if you want to not give yourself, you know, early onset diabetes by having ice cream for breakfast, lunch and dinner. <laughs> why are screens bad? Why does why, why? Why shouldn't I be able to watch a phone? I really, really want to. Well, I can't explain to my five year old the predations of the market and how the market wants you to get addicted to screens. So they have to just do it because I say so while I explain to them that their mind will get them addicted to or their body will get them addicted and that the, the makers of the iPhone or whatever want them to be addicted uh, to it in a way that's not really conducive to their freedom, right? So we can't really, and their own self-determination, instead their acts will be determined by, you know, Tim Scott or, uh, not Tim Scott, the guy, the guy who's the head of Apple. Anyway, so you need institutional constraints in order to, um, in order to live meaningful lives. And for people who don't see that, I say, what happens when you liberalize soccer? And we just allow people to use their hands if they really, really want to. And we call anytime, <laughs> and we call anytime people use, use uh, are forbidden to use their hands, but they really, really want to. We call that oppression. What happens? Well, it means that nobody gets to play soccer anymore, because I need, in order to be a soccer player, other people to forswear using their hands, even when they really, really want to, even if it would feel good. And if you liberalize soccer, and say like, well. No fault, no fault hands. <laughs> you could just use hands when you want to without incurring any penalty. Then nobody gets to be a soccer player. Nobody can get to be the specific thing that we are that's only realized when we all agree to forswear the use of, 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 of hands. All right? Right. Uh, all right. So following on that, uh, actually I actually had a discussion with uh, another black philosopher on this uh, recently. Uh, it was online. It was pretty short, but... Uh, I know you've talked about this a lot, and it is an important topic. Uh, about when is it that people can actually finally care about freedom? Uh, you know, for this person, uh, what came up was uh, a big pet peeve of yours, Maslow's hierarchy. And this person, well, I was talking to them, and the argument was like, well, you can't expect people to care about these higher ideals, you know, if uh, all they have is like they're living paycheck to paycheck, you know, they they got to think about their stomach first. Uh, and, you know, this is typical Maslow's hierarchy, you know, before you meet these higher needs, you got to meet all these other lower basic material needs. Oh, what is wrong with that? Well, I think all of those needs are always present. <laughs> all of those needs are always present. And the idea that we have to not get them all is a strategy because then we can manipulate people. I, I think it's, I think Maslow, I think it's a strategy um, that's empirically false, right? So if people didn't if people prioritize their biological needs, then there would be no freedom fighters. There would be no, nobody would go to war um, for God and country. There would have been no crusades. There wouldn't have been that guy who immolated himself to start the Arab Spring. There wouldn't have been founders, found, uh, founding fathers or Patrick Henry saying, give me liberty or give me death. Um, and so it's empirically dicey. There wouldn't have been a civil rights movement um, where people put bodily harm. There wouldn't have been like 
you know, the, the anti-colonial movement in India. So it's empirically dicey that it's just some sort of fact of, of, of the human that we do this. And, you know, there's a reason why people will sacrifice their body for self-determination and why, why there were slave revolts. So it's also completely rational that people would sacrifice their body for and their 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 so quote unquote lower needs for self determination. It's completely rational because they don't want to live, but not actually live out who they are, which is completely um, it's completely rational. The strategy of of a pro, uh, propagandizing Maslow is that it legitimizes a quality of political cowardice and um, um, it legitimizes a quality of status quo politics that's not particularly that's 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 comfortable for bourgeois living right so now it becomes irrational it becomes irrational to care about self determination if that's um if if that's going to jeopardize your job it becomes irrational to uh, do pretty much anything in the New Testament. <laughs> because if you look at anything of Jesus' teaching, they're all pretty much going against Maslow. You know, if, if, if Maslow was in Gethsemane, um, then Peter is Maslow, right? So if Maslow's in Gethsemane, then Jesus bounces before, before going to the cross, right? So pretty much the entire New Testament is kind of helping you think through why this immediate gratification you get by securing your bodily needs is actually leads to a deeper spiritual harm that once you continue to live, you'll just kind of be sad and deranged and not know why, <laughs> right? Because it turns mm -hmm. out that your life isn't as meaningful as mere life isn't meaningful if it's not also somewhat good and can be justified to yourself. Right. If look, right. if life was the only, the only thing people needed out of life, then they wouldn't leave inheritances, and we would just say that the person who lived the longest did it the best, which means folks like MLK and Jesus were just failures, and Frank, they were all just failures at life. Like, <laughs> and Frank, Martin Luther King, and Barbara Walters all lived. Were all born at the same year. Barbara Walters died last year apparently if life is the most important thing in life barbara walters did it the best right because you know <laughs> she lasted the longest so life isn't the most important thing in life but since we don't have a language for that and we have so many incentives and so many people make so much money and can secure comfort by um you know deforming the culture into telling people that life is the most important thing of life then uh it becomes I don't know. It becomes part of a con. You know who gets this? The COVID people, right? Like the, the conservative, not COVID deniers, but COVID relativizers. The, the conservative people who said like, all right, COVID might be real, but I don't want to close down my schools for it because like I, I need my kids to be able to go to a real school. I don't want to close down my business because I like this is part of my way of life. I'm willing to risk COVID to keep my business open. I'm willing to risk COVID to keep my kids in school. And, yeah. uh, and because they understood that, you know, life is like the way of life is more important than life. And they, and the people who actually secured their way of life while everybody else was scared actually ended up on top in a way that like, we're not, we're not, I think adult enough to admit that a lot of our, um, a lot of the miscues we took during the pandemic and our response to, pande to the pandemic are the outgrowth of, I think, a deformed culture that thought that life is the most important part of life. And the reason why healthcare politics, while seemingly universal and seemingly popular and seemingly attractive can't really move elections in the way that Democrats and the socialist left who like the, the socialist left that thinks that healthcare politics is more, like the most important kind of politics expects it to. It never does. Right. Because right. The other, you, while you're talking about health, the other person's talking about a way of life and freedom and the people who talk about a way of life and freedom, you know, they're winning elections. 
because it turns out that on some deep level, people know that life isn't the most important thing in life, but that the good life and that a meaningful life and that a life that actually expresses our will is the most important thing in life. Right, right. And that's a good segue for uh, another question. Uh, you talk a lot about, uh, and you mentioned this, specifically this phrase, that, uh, and this goes against the general tendency of the left uh, in the West gen uh, today, uh, which is, you know, they're, they're mostly influenced by Marx and, you know, they consider themselves a materialist. Right. Uh, and for them, you know, the battle of, of society is just simply a class struggle. Whereas you've talked about that, you know, uh, there's a battle for people's minds, that these questions of the deeper meanings of freedom, what is it to be a person, what is it to be free, uh, are really important. Right. right, so, you know, the Marxist class struggle is so unfortunately reductive for this because it actually doesn't delve into the questions of what it means to actually, you know, participate in institutions of freedom. So even if you have some sort of Marxist understanding of market, of, of the employment market and the labor market and the antagonism between employers and employees, that's, not, that's only one form of freedom. And that's only one form of class, right? So there's also people who own property versus people who don't own property because property is another form of freedom. The idea that like the government will protect <laughs> some external object as mine versus the people who need that object and use that object, the renters, um, and who don't get that kind of protection. Though that's another class divide that that that's going to um, uh, uh, that's going to be mapped on to freedom. But because you only have one kind of understanding of freedom that comes through the market and the labor market, you don't understand that actually. If we're going to talk about class divisions, talk about. Or workers and employees, but also talk about the propertyed versus the unpropertyed. Also talk about the married versus unmarried. People who are married, are the married with families, they'll do awful things to preserve like their kids' school districts, <laughs> right? So the people who right. um, will do awful things to preserve the reputation of their kids' school districts versus those without kids. Like those two people are not on the same side, even if they both work a salary on a job, right? And so you have to, people with inheritances versus people who don't have an inheritance. Are they really class? Are they really people with family money versus people without family money? Are they really on the same class just because they happen to be on the same shop floor? Um, just because they're both making $12 an hour? But one just knows that Mima, once once Papa and Mima die, that they're going to get like a hundred thousand dollar windfall as as long as like you know some progressive and doesn't come to power with a death tax. Are they really on the same side on political questions? Like no. So if we're gonna have the class antagonism. Um, conversation, we need to actually work through all of these different spheres of freedom and how um, and how class works and how all of those actually realize different antagonisms internally to those spheres. People with family money versus people without family money. Two different classes, even if they work on the same job. People with property, people without property. Renters versus homeowners. Two different classes, even if they might work on the same job. Right? All right. Um, so we have to, we just have to, you know, people who actually have their religion upheld by the state in a recognized way because they happen to be Catholic or a Protestant religion that's been around for a while versus, you know, incipient causes. Are they in the same class? Like, no. <laughs> um, if they think that the incipient cause is going to undermine like their standard traditional religion, then no, they're not of the same class. So we need to understand all of the different forms of freedom and then understand that people in antagonistic relationships internal to those different forms of freedom are also in different classes. And, you know, and this is, I guess we can segue into race talking about this because this is why a lot of class reductionists don't get the appeals of race. Because race reproduces a kind of way of life uh, especially, you know, the dominant race, the dominant, the dom that is, that functions as a class, right? So you might, 
you might not be making as much money as you were, as you would if you were unionized at your job. But since you use your money to send your kid to like a kind of like white school in a white neighborhood and you want to keep like, you know, that way of life that you come to think about as yours and your entitlement, even, even if it's premised on other people's degradation, then you're going to fight against the union that would actually democratize money and then allow other people to come into your neighborhood and would like lose your and 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 upset the apple cart at your church in a way. Um, right, right. So actually, you read my mind on this because that's exactly where I wanted to go uh, to shift it towards the question of, of race and Eidos. Um, you know, the, this is uh, still on the left a big thing. Uh, the whole idea of reparations, they're like, oh, well, you know, most people aren't for that, but, you know, everybody's working class, so, you know, gains for the working class, you know, all rising tide lifts all boats, right? Yeah. No, so I actually, I actually, I'm a big fan of the Eidos movement. Uh, it's American Descendants of Slaves, and uh, because it's a lineage-based movement. And if you don't think lineage matters, I don't know what you do around the holidays. I don't know what stories you tell yourself. But lineage, I don't know who you know who's bought a house in the, in the economy in the last 10 years, but a lot of money and a lot of, like, a lot of cultural benefit and a lot of cultural... And I don't know who you go to advi for advice, but it's going to be someone from your lineage, right? I don't know what your aspirations for your future, but if you have kids, they might be aspirations for your lineage. So lineage matters because other people's aspirations, you know a generation ago are realized in your life and your aspirations right now are going to be realized in, you know, in, in, in your effect and what goes through uh, like your line. Right. And lineage can work a lot of different ways, but one of the more powerful ways it works is through biology. Right. Right. So like random people aren't in other people's wills as much as their kids are or their spouses are. Right, so a lineage-based reparations one, does two things. Does uh, uh, does does two things. One, it recognizes that the lineage of American descendants of slaves was stolen. So all of their legacy goods, including like all of the legacy goods that were given to other Americans who have been here this long and have worked so much to build this nation, including like the Homestead Act and the GI Bill and all those New Deal programs, those are all functionally in a powerful way um, robbed of, like, black descendants of slaves are robbed of that. Right? Yeah, quite literally robbed, right? Like, it's not a metaphorical. Yeah, it's, I mean, there's a great book on this called uh, uh, The Color of Money by Mercer Baradaran, if you want the detail of, of that. But there's also something I've been reading more about in the terrorism of uh, Jim Crow, about how black families, even the ability to have a family, has been overdetermined by the needs of white capital. Like during Jim Crow, it was just like, well, take your kid out of school and put him on uh, and put them in the field. Or guys leaving, and you know the obvious examples are you know the Jim Crow need to put so many black men in prison, but also guys leaving for jobs and just the over determination of black family life, and just the terror of black family life and what it took to sustain a family through Jim Crow, and we need and how to redress the lineage deprivations of the stress that Jim Crow put on the black family. And even the liberalization of, of divorce. Like some people say like, well, there'd be just as many single black families without slavery and Jim Crow as there are with the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow. And that's just not true, right? So like in this era of no-fault divorce in the 70s, that really kind of took fire in the black community because there was no culture that there was no cultural control in black communities to protect black families from that media onslaught of like, well, if you're not happy with your husband, just leave. So 80%, 70 to 80% of divorces are initiated by women and then 
um, 90% if they're college educated. And so we just have to understand that without, like, both the concerted, the, the, the concerted explicit attack on the black family, which was most of America up until, you know, the 60s, and then the liberal <laughs> attack on the black family that just kind of like, almost financially incentivized women to leave their husbands, like, that actually has legacy costs today um, because, you know, you put your kids at a statistical disadvantage when you take away their parent. And first of all, and then I was talking, I was thinking a few days ago about spiritual math and how to explain this. And people think, well, you know, 50-50, 50-50 custody solves that. And I'm like, well, parenthood isn't really 50-50. Parenthood is 100-100. Both parents are putting in everything. So you go from 200% parenting as a child, getting 200% parenting, to getting 50% parenting as like, you know, now as a, as a broken family. And that we've just casualized that and kind of um, we took away any ability for black communities to build institutions to kind of thwart that liberalization of, you know, feminist, the feminist ideology of you're not happy with your marriage for any reason, just leave. Um, and, you know, a lot of white women were trying to get rid of their abusive husbands, uh, but like had to kind of gin themselves up for it because they didn't have access to, they wouldn't be able to keep their quality of life that they, that they've gotten accustomed to that was dependent on their abusive husband's income for black people, for black couples, that wasn't even the issue because like black women <laughs> like were like as stable in the job market as black men. So they were like, well, this guy doesn't, doesn't provide anyway. So like, why not just leave if I get mad? And so like, there wasn't an internal check against that attitude of liberalization. And now like black people are whose culture was decimated so that it didn't have an internal check against that liberalization are now living the legacy of not being able to check liberalism with respect to kind of divorce culture. And, and the idea that you don't need a man, you know, that the kids don't need a dad. Um, like we didn't have the cultural resources to check that because our cultural resources were decimated and innervated by the legacy of being of our families being overdetermined by the needs of slavery and then the the needs and anxieties of Jim Crow, right? So right, right. the reparations would be for a lot of degradations that are still realized in Black American life. Anything about Black American life that would be better if slavery and Jim Crow hadn't happened need to be repaired because slavery and Jim Crow happened like with the blessings of all manners of cultural institutions in America, including churches, businesses, and the government. Right, right. So what do you have to say to people like Morgan Freeman and the Will Smiths of the world to say, well, no, you know, I'm black. I made it, you know, just work hard. <laughs> well, there, I mean, the system needs examples. The system needs Oprah. The system loves Oprah, too, because, heck, if you uphold Oprah, then you uphold a woman and someone who's black, and, <laughs> and you don't have to do anything else. <laughs> you get a twofer. And so the system needs examples. Or an Obama. Uh, with the Obama, you get a whole black family. The, the system needs counterexamples in order to kind of cover over the masses. So you don't look at the exceptions, you look at the masses, you look at aggregate data. You look at, there, is, there are no middle-class black communities in America. Um, like, because there just isn't a, a quality of dispersion of wealth and stability that could support communities in America, uh, that kind of community in America. So you have to understand that these guys are paid to be the exception. And it's not, and that's part of their job. Their job isn't really working hard. Their job is mouthing um, the quality of exceptionalism of, that actually covers the standing reproduction of black degradation in America. It's not getting better. It's not getting better. And then nobody's paid to talk about it, which is why I'm kind of grateful that you have me on shows like yours so that people can actually 
you know, talk about it and think through this. And by the way, if you want um, a good book, if the listeners want a good book on reparations that actually works through the nuts and bolts of how it would work, go from go get from here to equality by uh, looking at it right now by uh, William Sandy Darity. And people say like, well, you know, what about people who just kind of claim to be black? And he's like, and Darity comes up with a pretty good um, solution to that. He's like, look, either, well, you have to fulfill two requirements. One, you have to somehow show that you have a descendant who was an American slave. And two, you have to show that you claimed being black sometime um, uh, for 12 years prior to the initiation of this legislation, right? So if you have, you can, mm-hmm. and, and any kind of marginal cases will be adjudicated by a tribunal of people who are non-marginal <laughs> cases, right? And, and that's just how, so you set up a tribunal of, of, of uncomplicated American descendants of slaves, and they're the ones who decide um, whether marginal cases count as black. So this isn't actually hard. We put a person in the moon. We can figure out a way to, to work out the community degradation and to, to repair the community degradation that was done by, you know, a few centuries of terrorism. Um, All right, right. Actually, the funny thing is uh, early on in my channel, actually, back, uh, back when Bernie was running for the first time in uh, 2016, uh, I made a video because uh, it, thanks to you and your work, Antonio Moore's and Yvette Carnell's, like the whole reparations question became a thing i literally saw that happen uh, uh i was supporting your channel when you guys first began i donated for your first oh, camera equipment uh, oh yeah so you did see the whole thing happen. yeah i saw the whole thing happen i knew it was because of you guys it, it was amazing um and i actually did a, uh, uh there's somebody i watched uh she's gotten a bit bigger now uh kim iverson and she made a video and she was like oh well, this reparation thing is uh, it's uh, she's like one uh, the, the, the slaves are dead you know, what do you need reparations for? And two, she's like, we can't tell who deserves it. You know, you know who is really descended? Uh, and she actually asks, well, you know, anybody who has uh, comments, you know, otherwise, proving otherwise, uh, you know, uh, say something and I'll respond to you. Uh, and I actually did. I, I, I did a whole video responding to her. She never responded to me, but she responded to other people. Uh, and it wasn't that, you know, she asked so many people that were like responding to her. They weren't. <laughs> uh, so she, she specifically ignored my response. Uh, but that video blew up, uh, and it was uh, from the stuff I learned from you guys. Um, yeah. You know, uh, you guys uh, enlightened me to these facts, which, you know, before I, I also would have thought these things. are like, well, you know, what does this really mean? Right. Yeah, well, we don't, under- we don't understand what legacy means. We don't understand. If you don't, and if you don't understand what legacy and lineage means, you don't, you don't understand the degradation that was done to black communities. I'm just thinking like my own kids and I, you know, I talk a lot about my kids on both my show. And and I guess on this show, they have so many advantages that I just didn't have if for no other reason than I'm their dad culturally. And I just think about all of the things like just, they have me as a resource. Like, like it's, it's absurd the inequality, and I feel bad for the kids who have to compete with my kids. <laughs> like, like and, and, and I'm told that like it's fair because it's not fair. It's it's not fair. Um, and that the kinds of quality of culture I'm able to give to my kid, my kids, because of like the study I've put through. It, it, once, what it does actually is now clarify my own kind of anxieties when I was younger and I was wondering, how does everyone know so much about like how to be in the world? Well, it's because they actually had a functional culture. <laughs> they actually had a functional culture. And they, you know, the best the way they say, the best way to raise a prodigy is have a parent who's a prodigy <laughs> or like, a, 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 or, or a failed prodigy or something like that. Like there's just no, there's no substitute for, I mean, there are very few substitutes and they're very kind of expensive substitutes for just having parents with resources and a culture to know what they're doing. One of my professors, um, I don't even think he'll mind me saying his name, is Dr. Halper. I was talking to him about his three kids and he's got three sons and he was telling me about, um, well, you know, three boys, two of them, are, he's a philosophy professor. 
uh, two of his boys are philosophy professors. One of his boys, quote, didn't never finish his education. And I'm thinking, oh, he never finished his education. That's bad. And then it comes out 15 minutes later. It turns out that third son is ABD. That means all but dissertation. So by never finish his education, it means that like he's a dissertation away from having a PhD. Right? <laughs> so that's like, and, you know, help is an Orthodox Jew. And that's just kind of like the culture that the kids were brought up in. But that culture is pretty specific and kind of rigorous and robust in a way that people who didn't who weren't growing up in that kind of culture are just not going to understand the advantages that such a culture brings you. Now the kid is the kid who never finished his education is doing quite well for himself. Surprise, surprise. Um, um, because he actually to you know most conventional people like actually has a very good education. <laughs> um, he's a writer in DC. And so uh, since we don't understand what culture provides and what lineage means and just the ability to like pick up a phone and have someone give you good advice uh, about like, like all aspects of your life, we don't understand what it means that that was taken away from entire communities. Um, yeah, indeed, so, indeed. yeah. Yeah. Did you like uh, the actually, Alpha story? <laughs> yeah, very interesting. Um, related to that, going on, go, continuing on from kids. Um, what is the role of art in, in society uh, as art. you see it? Art uh, is kind of an immediate awareness of how to be free. I'm getting this right now because my kids, I'm, I'm, my kids ask me, is it okay if they keep reading non, uh, fiction? Because my kids love reading fiction. And I love them reading fiction, and and I think yes. <laughs> Because it helps you think about and move through and feel freedom in a way that you don't. Um, and it, you need these kind of emotions to get you kind of, art gets you pumped up for the right things and then gets you shame, feeling ashamed for the right things of like, and, and how to conduct yourself. It might not give you the quality of intellectual deliverance that, say, philosophy does, but it gives you the emotions that'll get you to do the work of of actually getting and will get you the emotions to, to tell you that like it's worthwhile to 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 do the work of philosophy to figure out how to live your life meaningfully because like when you see an artist's depiction of someone strung out on drugs like that will that will without having to read studies about what drugs do to the brain that'll actually move you i'm still you know a lot of people talk a lot of smack about the dare program it worked for me. The D.A.R.E. program is the kid. I still don't, I don't drink or do drugs or anything like that just because I like my mind and I'm scared that uh, it, like, <laughs> my God. <laughs> yeah, so I agree with you. It worked on me too. It worked. It worked, right? <laughs> I don't like, and I'm glad it worked. And I wanted to, I'm, I'm thinking about send, showing my kids, sending them down and showing them the egg commercial where uh, they say, this is your brain. This is your brain on drugs. Any questions? Because after when I saw that, I didn't really have too many questions. It kind of made sense to me. <laughs> yeah. And I'm glad it worked on me. And I like the quality. Of I, and I like that culture. And that was a form of art that worked. It wasn't a rigorous argument. And it definitely wasn't uh, scientific in terms of empirical science. It was just like an artistic display that had the appropriate, immediate emotional impact to kind of put me on to guide my emotions in a way that that allowed a quality of self-determination in my life. Because people who are addicted to drugs aren't self-determination. And all that took was just like a guy who sounded like MacGyver. I watched a lot of TV when I was a kid. So a guy who sounded like MacGyver who said, this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs. And and I thought, you know, since I watch a lot of TV on when I was a kid, MacGyver is a guy who every week used his brain to um, end up like kind of hooking up with a very attractive damsel in distress. I would like to do that. <laughs> and so like when MacGyver tells me not to use drugs, I didn't use drugs. And then later on, I realized for other reasons why it's good not to use drugs. But the art gave me kind of the immediate emotional disposition to eschew bad decisions and actually go after like good decisions that later can be justified. But at the time, even its justifications wouldn't have been particularly moving. Right, right. The way so the related to that, right. um, as, as a person, and then from a philosophical point of view, and as a father, right. uh, the one of my, like, uh, I'll ask you right now, but before that, do you know who uh, uh, Sunrise? Who? Sunra? Sun yeah, the drummer, right? Yeah, and uh, 
jazz uh, musician. Jazz drummer without time, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know if he was a drummer. He played a lot of things, but uh, oh, okay. he, he has a. Uh, he was a big into the uh, Black Power movement. A lot about that. Um, a great artist, and uh, he has a big thing about discipline. You know, and he says, you know, one of the most important things is that you cannot be free without discipline. I know. I know that you teach your kids to play violin and classical. Uh, yeah. What do you see? How important is that? Oh, it's it's very important because there are only so many there are only so many things meaningful things we let kids do. <laughs> I'm realizing um, for reasons, but there are only so many ways that they can actually excel in things that are kind of healthy and beautiful that can take that are worthwhile for all their energy. And I think music is one of them. And also, it teaches um, rhythm and meter and and attention to other people gets them inside outside of themselves. Anything where you have to pay attention to something, you create something that you then have to pay attention to and kind of moderate your, yourself to is a good thing because then you're not just wild and crazy because, you know, people without discipline, you can't, you don't want to be in any sort of meaningful relationships with them, right? They can't keep promises. <laughs> and if you can't keep promises, what kind of relationships can you have with someone who's like an inveterate entitled flake? Oh, oh so, yeah, yeah. I definitely know that people flake so much these days. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's frustrating because like you're trying to like make a better world, but you're trying to have relationships with people who are flake, with with flakes. And um, I think it only gets getting get you only need to be stood up once to realize that like flakes are bad for the world. <laughs> I stood up for one date, and then all of a sudden you're a Kantian. Um, uh, so the music I think for them gives them an emotionally charged expression that kind of dignifies discipline in a way that's safe and beautiful. That's and great. so I do, they have to be attentive to play music well, as, but then they get to see the beauty of it at the end. And there aren't too many things. I guess maybe some people, one of my friends like baking for that reason, where if you just kind of follow the recipe and you do what you're told, at the end you have something delicious. So, so so um, music's like that, except it's a little bit more freedom because um, it's not as fixed by nature. It's, 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 it's a little bit more fickle. So you really have to attend and, and kind of like massage it in a way to make sure everything's in tune um, in a way that maybe you don't have to do with baking because if you just kind of measure right and everything will come out delicious. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, now I'm going to ask you some questions some people ask me to ask you. But uh, what do you think about uh, hookup culture? You know, how do you relate that to the ways okay. in which people today, you know, obviously don't think that commitment to someone else is important? I think hookup culture is fine for what it is. I think it's fine for what it is. I believe people should date. Um, I don't think it's a substitute for the particular kind of freedom you get from someone who's committing to work things out with you because that's what a marriage is a marriage is nothing other than someone committing to work things out with you no matter what the content of what goes into that is up to the people involved but you're now like you're with someone and you can now have a special relationship with someone who's committed to like no matter how they feel in the immediate moment if they wake up and hate you it doesn't matter they got to work it out with you and that you, it allows a, a, a different kind of way of being with that person that you can't get in a hookup culture. But hookup culture allows for a variety of experimentation that you can't get in marriage. So I just don't confuse one for the other. Um, mm -hmm. And if you're not satisfied and if you expect the freedom of marriage through a hookup culture, you're just not going to get it. You'll just always be like anxious. <laughs> because part of hookup mm -hmm. culture is mean like you know if someone wakes up one day and doesn't feel it they can just quit you so what kind of plans can you make with someone who can just quit you based on a feeling that's like that without any sort of justificatory reason um what kind of plans you can make certain plans with them and you can make certain plans knowing that you can quit them but you can't make other kinds of plans and it's those other kinds of plans we need to actually support being able to make two, <laughs> right? Can't buy a house with mm -hmm. someone who's just kind of wake up one day and has the right to just kind of like leave because the logistics of untangling that is you can barely have a pet with that kind of person. So like for what kind, for the kind of freedom you need, 
it is appropriate, but don't mix freedom. Don't expect the freedom you get from a marriage to come from a hookup. And don't expect the freedom you get from a hookup to come from a marriage. Mm -hmm. does, that, uh, does that do the work? Yeah, yeah. You? That's, that's a good. Uh, another one. Uh, what are your personal views of religion? Are you religious? Uh, do you think religion is important? I mean, a lot of the people nowadays, it's uh, people are, are increasingly both on the left and right, uh, not comfortable saying you know, they are religious. They want to say oh, I'm spiritual at best. Uh, a lot of people just view religion as a, a radically individual thing of, you know, whatever it is that you believe, but they don't view it as an institutional thing. If you don't have any spiritual habits, then you're just going to be kind of predated upon by market influences that are organized to kind of manipulate your pleasures and pains, right? And you'll end up living your life and then turning back and realize you were living your life manipulated by like very smart marketing departments. So I, I think you need spiritual habits to defend yourself against making decisions that you will regret because of market manipulations, right? So, um, so I do think spiritual habits are important. And some of those spiritual habits come through religion. Some of them come through thought and kind of working through like the institutions of freedom. But if you don't have the resources to do all of that, just like I have now more robust reasons why I don't drink and do drugs. But if all I had was the egg in the frying pan, that in some ways would be enough. <laughs> like if all I had was the religion, like I don't need a, like I said, I, I bought the Catholic homeschooling stuff uh, this weekend. It's coming in the mail this week. I'm going to peruse it and probably spend the summer teaching it. But like, because I want to be able, if all you have are like the Catholic kind of <laughs> taxonomy of sins, that's that, that keeps you from like, not doing those things, that's, that's, that's not nothing. That's better than someone who doesn't have those things. If all you have is Dante's Inferno running around in the back of your mind about like the different levels of hell and what people did to get there. Um, I do, I, I, I think of that because I often think about the people in the vestibules who never committed one way or the other. Um, and, and what that means, that's already, that's, that's content that will keep you from making kind of big mistakes. So I do think people need spiritual content because without spiritual content, they'll be manipulated by um, material desires and inducements. And for real meaning in life, it needs to be understood and make sense and be explainable and explicable to other people. And for that, it needs to be um, uh, spiritual because that's the stuff that you can actually talk about rather than just immediately feel. You can actually communicate both to yourself. You can make sense to yourself. You want your life to make sense to yourself. And a lot of the immediate gratifications of materialism won't actually make sense to yourself in a way that the more spiritual ones will because they're kind of, they run through the intellectual. They run through like the more intellectual pleasures. Right? So religion can, religion does, and I think in an important way, provide bulwark or a guardrail against some of the predations of the market. That way we can have markets without having markets take over all of meaningful aspects of our life. And if we're not going to make everyone, you know, Hegelian philosophers, if we're not <laughs> like, um, to the extent that like, right. the, then like religion is the, is a higher class of the egg on the fry frying pan that'll get people to do the right things for like a kind of right reason, but just not intellectually robust in the same way. Right, right. So here's one for me. Uh, you talk a lot about the problems of white culture. Right. And uh, a lot of people definitely obviously see you as a device on this. Right. Uh, and you know, there are definitely quite a bit of people on the left who, you know, they get antsy of like, oh, well, you were dividing people up. And, you know, can't we just all talk about our shared universal interest and leave these little divisions out there, you know, solved later? Um, what is your response to that? 
So, I mean, the libertarianism that we talked about, that property rights are the most important rights and the only rights that matter, that's an artifact of white culture, which is a kind of a, an artifact of colonialism. There weren't white and black people before colonialism. Like, my dad's from Ghana, my mom's from South Carolina, but my dad's from Ghana. And in, in Ghana, there aren't really black people. You have different tribes. <laughs> <laughs> and the different tribes and different lineages. Like blackness and whiteness was created for the colonial project. And so they had an entire like family structure, an entire gender ideology, an entire religious upbringing, including like some aspects of the doctrine of discovery, which legitimized colonialism through the Catholic church that, and like the libertarianism of Hobbes that, and you know, locked, like fetishization of property and kind of degradation of self-government that went into making the South Carolina constitution. That's all a part of white culture and it's all hostile to a more robust realization of right. I, uh, more real of, of the of plurality of rights, right? So we have to get, we have to address some of, and there, it passed from parents to children and through, um, why ethnic institutions that like other rights don't matter, um, that uh, yeah, certain conceptions of the family pass through institutions that are just hostile to actually understanding uh, family freedom. For example, you can say that you know the family is something that the government shouldn't take a part in, but yet there was this shooter. I think there was this shooter in Nashville. They just charged. It was a six-year-old who wounded his kindergarten teacher, and they charged the mother <laughs> because of the six-year-old wounding the kindergarten teacher. And if you, unless you understand that, like, actually, how you raise your six-year-old matters, like, for public consumption, then it wouldn't make sense to charge the mother. But if you have a culture, if you have a tradition that says, like, well, family's family, and outside of the family, those bonds shouldn't, like, matter then you don't understand that actually the public has an interest in making sure that the mother teaches gun safety, which means keeping the gun away from your six-year-old to the six-year-old so that it's not just the six-year-old's um, um, responsibility to not shoot the kindergarten teacher. It's the mother's responsibility as a mother to you know, hide their gun, right? So, and the same reason, the, the, I mean, I think that we need to in, like encroach Upon this is something your philosophers will, uh, the philosophers in your audience will appreciate. Yeah, Socrates getting pinched for corrupting the youth makes more and more sense, and also the impiety. But all, but for corrupting the youth it makes more and more sense as I see how powerful corrupting the youth is for promoting justice. Right. So right now there are a lot of white people who won't really, they don't really care what I have to say, and they don't have to care what I have to say. But they do have to care what their kids say. To them about the black, what I have to say about reparations, they won't care. But they will have to say, they will have to ask, they will have to address their kids about reparations if the kids ask the questions about like, so all of these lineage benefits that I'm getting, um, and I know Papa was racist, and that's how we have this family, and I'm going to inherit the family farm. What does that mean for the for for you know the people that Papa was racist towards that secures me this farm that now allows me to inherit like. A lot of people don't want to have to answer that question, or the Homestead Act, or all, all of the, they don't want to they don't want to have to answer these questions from their kids. They can ignore them when it comes from me, but they won't they won't ignore them when it comes from their kids, and they can't ignore them when they come from their kids if they want a real relationship with their kids. And so they have a vested interest in keeping their kids away from learning about these things in school. But my concern for justice and the realization of freedom has a vested interest in in the public school curriculum that's invading in that culture that says that they shouldn't have to learn this, right? So if white culture tells white parents that they shouldn't have to learn about the dicey aspects of the racial legacy of the United States, but justice in the United States requires that white parents have a hard conversation with their kids about the you know, racial aspects of the United States that might not be flattering to the family, to their family, then white culture has to change. And that's why a lot of these Moms for Liberty groups, and you can just Google Moms for Liberty, they are actually, are, they really want to censor, you know, the racial history of the United States, and they want to do it as mothers. They want to do it as parents. They want to do it because they think that's a sacrosanct cultural identification that's tied to their whiteness. Um, but, so we're going to have to change white motherhood. 
if white motherhood means not talking to your kids or not having to talk to your kids about the racial justice history of the United States, then that means we have to change white motherhood. So, you know, and so far as that is a part of the entitlements of the white family, that means racial justice in the United States means changing the white family. Right, right. Thank you. Yep. All right. If you want to connect to that, uh, we mentioned, you talked about this a, a little bit earlier, but I want you to expand on it. Uh, feminism nowadays on the left is almost a sacrosanct word. Like if you go against, if you say you're not a feminist, you're, you're going against the, the beehive. Uh, yeah. But, you know, as a, I've noticed over the years, it took me a, quite a while to, to, to begin questioning these things. Uh, part of it was thanks to you and other thinkers. Uh, in which, you know, the realization is that uh, feminism as it largely exists in the West is white feminism, right. uh, unquestionably. So that even people who deny that they're really part of that, you know, and they're like, oh, no, we're intersectional. We're always, uh, conveniently, they always end up siding with uh, white feminism. You know, white feminism is part of what sank Bernie Sanders. You know, people don't <laughs> pay attention to that. Twice. Yeah. I, I, you know, anytime there's a real progressive movement, there's always some variety of feminism that comes out to sink it, right? The white feminism is the reason why we can't call like Elizabeth Warren the snake that she is. <laughs> like, I don't, I, I, it's really, so there are a few things going on, right? So there's a division of labor in society and a division of risk in society. And for a long time, and even to the present, the division of labor, especially household labor, is gendered um, where women don't get the greatest or share the greatest choice in the labor they do and the greatest quality of work that they're allowed to do, right? So there's a, the feminist call to equalize the division of labor in society is actually a just one, I think. But there's also a division of risk in society that's gendered male. And if feminism wanted to actually equalize that, uh, that division of risk, then I think we would have a real movement. But that division of risk includes who asks out whom on the first date, who's expected to propose to whom, who's expected to protect and provide. And by protecting, that often means uh, protecting you from things that you don't want to have to deal with yourself from mouses to Negroes, right? So like, there's a reason why the face of racism is a white guy someone like Trump, but the, the drive for racism isn't gendered in such, isn't, is, is, is as many white women as there are white men, right? So, um, white guys get a bad rap <laughs> in a lot of ways because they're doing things in order to secure white women that then white women just lie about wanting. And I, and I'm not, and you know, so, there's a quality of feminism that presumes either women are morally superior to men because women are sugar and spice and everything nice, or men are trash, which indirectly assumes the moral superiority and naturalizes and normalizes the moral superiority, superiority of women. And insofar as it naturalizes the moral superiority of women, we're not allowed to talk about how a lot of women are bad at doing gendered jobs. Like a lot of women are bad mothers. <laughs> like, we're not allowed to talk about child abuse that happens by women who, like, you know, aren't particularly good at raising children. I'm not one of these guys who thinks that women are, as women, are particularly great at raising children, as women, because they're women. Um, I, 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 I don't. <laughs> I, 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 that's just, I, that's not what I see. And actually, over the age of eight, single parent fathers, actually, the outcomes are better. So, but the, there are a lot of, Anyway, so just the naturalization of gender characteristics that comes with feminism is, is a, a problem for me because I think we need to talk about the gender division of risk in life. You know, not just fighting in the military, but including fighting in the military. I think a real feminist would want, um, you know, women to sign up for selective service like I did when I was 18. Like men, although we don't have a draft, we could. And I think that draft should include women. And we have to understand, we don't talk enough about the anti-suffragettes. The anti-suffragettes were a movement um, of largely women uh, who thought that women would actually lose power if they were held politically responsible and accountable the way that men were, right? They, that women could exercise an, a moral authority. Look, on, look, uh, look for Josephine Dodge or Beecher. 
and very smart women who thought that women had more moral authority being conceived of as apolitical, especially elite women, because they could just like call their husbands by being seen as apolitical and above the political fray as opposed to being partisan. And we kind of see that culture now in the nonprofit industry complex that now get to like promulgate a political vision while also appearing to be non-political and non-partisan while still like realizing or, or like and we saw this with the covid response with the, a lot of a lot of feminists who wanted to support the science of masking and su support the science of closing schools and not support the science of Fauci when that was actually a political project but it was it appeared to be non-political right so mm -hmm. there's a lot of a lot of gender entitlements protect women from political accountability and responsibility. And until we, uh, that especially concerning risk, um, and, uh, and then disproportionately like shunt that risk to men that we don't get to talk about because we can't talk about women being perpetrators of harm or women as a class, as a gender identity being like a protected class. Uh, we talk about them somehow being minorities. Like, I they're not like, when they are the biggest voting demographic in the nation, like they've outvoted men for decades now. So, um, yeah. So my problem with feminism is the particularity of assuming that women, the assumption that women don't have substantive perks relative to men. Um, and if feminists would actually address those substantive perks, then I think I would be a feminist. But I think, like, then it probably wouldn't be called feminism. It would be called something else. Right, right. <laughs> uh, so, so, like, until we talk about the division of risk along with the division of labor, until we talk about uh, some of the naturalized assumptions and entitlements that women get as women that they don't want to give up, then then I am, I'm not quite a, a feminist because I would take equality in a way that they don't want to take it <laughs> um, and make a lot of women uncomfortable because we would have to talk about, I mean, I want to talk about how bad mothers are. I want to talk mm -hmm. about how bad parents are, but one of the reasons I can't talk about how bad, I want to talk about how bad teachers are in schools, but one of the reasons I can't talk about how bad mothers and parents are, one of the reasons I can't talk about how bad teachers are, so many of them are women, and I can't talk about how bad women are, or I'm a misogynist. So, you know, we have to, gender hides a lot of baggage for a lot of upper class and white women and men, and we're very comfortable dealing with all of the baggage it hides for the men. But we're not comfortable talking about all of the entitlements it hides for women. Um, that, they're, that they don't want to give up. <laughs> that there isn't a, mm -hmm. a public conversation of, of giving up. And what public accountability for women would look like, I don't like, that's just not a conversation we could have in a way that I think would be fruitful. And I want to have that conversation. So I'm not a feminist, but I am pro-justice and I consider myself progressive. But I am also mindful of all of these feminist movements that kind of come out in order to take out progressive challengers. Um, and I say this as a guy with daughters, my daughters are not going to do bad because of uh, like the, 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 their gender is not going to hold them back in a way. Uh, the women do are doing fine. The young women are doing fine in a lot of ways and are protected in a lot of ways. Um, Right, right. I mean, uh, that links up to uh, a lot of the work that uh, Tommy Curry does about uh, right. the disposability of uh, men, particularly black men. Right. No, I agree. I agree. All right, so my kids are coming home pretty soon from school. Uh, so can you give me one more question and then uh, we'll wrap up? Sorry, uh, my volume was very low. Let me repeat that. So in the U.S., we used to have uh, public intellectuals. We used to have philosophers who actually were known uh, among the public and did things to educate the public. Uh, what role do you see philosophy playing today and what could philosophers themselves do to integrate themselves back into society rather than being seen as, you know, these people in academic towers twiddling their thumbs? Right. So we don't have a real public that needs... Uh, so the problem... So one problem is that people don't want to make public decisions. 
<laughs> like liberalism says you don't have to make public, public public decisions and deliberate over decisions. You just have to actually just do what you want. Do what you want. Everybody should choose. And then like the market will work out through some magic. What well, will happen? And so if you don't have a public that that actually respects public deliberation towards institutionalizing, you know, realizing self-determination in institutions, then philosophers seem kind of extraneous because there's no argument that's going to have authority over your feeling, over your immediate feeling, right? And insofar as you think your immediate feeling should have authority, no matter what, you should always go with your gut. Like philosophers will tell you, your gut is like the sum of all of your unconscious anxieties and degradations that you haven't worked through and that you should in no way listen to your gut <laughs> mm -hmm. and anything that matters. But if, if, if liberalism tells you that you should just go with your gut, then you don't need people thinking and talking about arguments about why you should do X, Y, and Z. You just go with your feeling um, and the authority of that your feeling tells you, that, that it grants you. And so we have to talk about we have to talk about what it means that we don't even want like we don't want to govern as a people. We don't care about governing as a people. Nancy Pelosi was as safe in her seat as Saddam Hussein was in, in Iraq. It was, it was actually easier to get rid of, of of Saddam Hussein than it was Nancy Pelosi. We had to wait till Nancy Pelosi retired. Like there was no competitive process. We don't want to govern. We want the authority. We want the uh, like the authoritarianism of a government that will secure our non-political rights, that, that'll secure our property, that'll secure our families as we happen to, if, if that's the kind of family that happens to be popular at the time. We just want the government to secure that. We don't want progress and we don't want to deliberate about what progress means like, uh, looks like. And in a, in a culture that doesn't want to actually open its institution, its, its, quarters of power up to deliberating about what our institutions of freedom looks like, philosophers are kind of extraneous because the authority that would happen to like, that would go through public reason and argument gets shunted to just like individual appetites. Right, right. I agree. So it's not always just a, of a bad teacher. You can have bad students. <laughs> right, right. You can have bad students. Um, and we have a culture that's saying that you don't have to think to be good. I guess that's, Yeah. And if you don't have to think to be good, then people can be good without philosophers. You don't, you don't even have to think about art to be good. <laughs> like you don't, need to, you don't even need your thought to be mediated by good art to be good. It just needs to be mediated by like whatever gustorial intelligence <laughs> that's in your gut. Um, to, be, to be a good person, you don't have to think like about spiritual things right, at right. all. And, that, and in that world, there's no need for public intellectuals. Right, right. So we need to talk about how people need to actually think and reason publicly and make arguments even to themselves in order to be good. And then there's a, there'll be a space and an appetite for public intellectuals. We need to numb the satisfaction that people get with their immediate, with their immediate um, gratifications in order for them to actually ask bigger questions. And, you know, that's a kind of cultural project. And I use the word numb because I'm writing a paper on right now on Socrates and the Mino and how that kind of works into numbing satisfactions, numbing the immediate gratifications that will um, that will actually kind of provoke a deeper appetite. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Irony Osei Frimpong, the funky academic. <laughs> uh, this thank has been a wonderful me. interview. Yeah, I hope the people um, I hope the people appreciate like what you're doing and what I'm saying. I know we went on for a long time, but if you went on, if you made it all the way through here, through this hour plus conversation and you have questions, go ahead and shoot me an email. Uh, I am me at funkyacademic.com or go check out some of my other videos at, uh, on my page. All right. Yeah. Everybody check out his channel, check out his Twitter, give him a follow, donate to him. Yes. All right. All right. Thank you. Bye. Peace out. <laughs>